later that night the entire place is completely devastated and all we see is the wreckage of everything that was there before and again the cricket has got separated from Pinocchio and so he's trying to find him and Pinocchio ends up in this this bar that's shaped like an eight ball eight ball is kind of the random ball in in pool and anyways he's inside the eight ball and he's shooting pool with with Lampwick and that's just another indication of wasting his time basically and you can see in the forefront there there's some cards for gambling and so he's engaged in these sort of uh, you might say pointless hedonic pursuits and he's uh, enticing P Pinocchio along the same route and so he teaches him to smoke first that doesn't go very well so Pinocchio t <laughs> takes a huge drag on a cigar and it just about kills him and uh, when Lampwick asks him how he likes it, he shakes his head and says, you know, that it really, was really quite good, but he's so sick that he can hardly stand up, and he's hallucinating double balls on the pool table, and then the cricket shows up and stands on the eight ball and kind of gives one of those declamatory speeches again, you know, because he still hasn't quite figured out that standing up proud and spouting off the rules isn't exactly the right way for the conscience to behave, and uh, Lampwick picks him up by the scruff of the neck, roughly speaking, and first of all asks who he is, so obviously he's divorced from his own conscience, and then makes fun of Pinocchio for paying attention to this little bug. And uh, <clears throat> that's kind of a nice indication of what happens in adolescence, you know, because, of course, as the children move away from their parents and into their groups, especially when the groups are misbehaving, often what happens is that the other members of the group will torture a person who isn't willing to try something dangerous or foolish by making fun of the fact that they're, you know, too attached to their conscience. And there's a positive element to that because you should take some risks when you're a teenager and also later in life. And so if you won't take any risks, there's actually something wrong with you. But there's a negative element in that, well, you know, teenagers do all sorts of stupid things. And perhaps it's amazing that we all live through it, actually, as far as I'm concerned. And, some people take extraordinarily risks, <coughs> extraordinary risks, and they don't make it through at all, <coughs> or they end up in the permanently antisocial population, and then they're, you know, basically career criminals. Five percent of the criminals commit ninety-five percent of the crimes. It's another Pareto distribution. So, anyways. Lampwick isn't going to listen to Pinocchio and, or to the cricket. He laughs at him with this kind of braying laugh, which is some foreshadowing. And uh, the cricket gets all upset, puts his coat on backwards, and ends up dumped down a pool table hole and uh, otherwise abused. And so he stomps on out of there. He tells Pinocchio that he can take care of himself, and he stomps on out of there. And so Pinocchio is left without the guidance of conscience, and the cricket is trying to figure out how to get off Pleasure Island. But... He goes through the gates, and he sees what's actually going on. And what's going on is that the coachman has this, like, slave boat down in the bowels of the island. And he's got all these, these black-suited minions with the glowing eyes working for him, and they're rounding up what look like donkeys. And so they're beasts of burden, right? And so there's an idea here that if you, produce impu if you pursue impulsive pleasure, to the detriment of the development of your character, you're going to end up a beast of burden. You're going to end up a slave to a tyrant. And that's exactly right. And so, anyways, the cricket doesn't, you can see one of those black suited horrors here hauling donkeys out of this crate. And one of them has a hat on. And they look very sad. And they're in different crates. And one of them says, sold to the salt mines. And one says, sold to the circus. And so they're shipped off to be to be slaves, roughly speaking, and they look very sad. And then one of them gets hauled out of a crate, and he's still got a hat, he has a hat on and a sweater, and he can still talk. He's a boy, it turns out, that's been half transformed into a jackass, a braying jackass, prior to being enslaved. And so that's, that's another thing that's quite interesting about the story. You know, it, it, it also makes the case that if you replace your voice with stupid braying, that the probability that you're going to become enslaved by a tyrant is extraordinarily high. And I always can't help but think about ideologues in that manner. You know, 
Solzhenitsyn wrote about the radical left ideologues that got thrown in the Gulag Archipelago, you know, so they were par party stalwarts, this happened to a lot of people, true believers who were vacuumed up by the Stalinist machine and thrown, in, thrown into the Gulag anyways. And he said that those people suffered in some ways more than ev everyone else because, what did he say, they were bit by the beloved hand that fed them. And so the first while when they were in the camps, Solzhenitsyn really didn't know what to do with people like that because on the one hand, well, they were in the camps and wasn't that awful and they'd been torn away from their families and, you know, stripped of all their identity and their status and so that's pretty rough. But on the other hand, they were writing letters protesting their innocence and assuming that everyone else in the camp was guilty but they were innocent and they were still strident believers in the communist process. And so, you know, it was a conundrum. Here they are being terribly punished, but by the same token, they're also the perpetrators of their own demise, so how do you deal with them? And They used to play comrades, he said they used to play comrades with people like that and invite them into an ideological discussion about the camp situation and the situation in the country as a whole and let them rattle out their ideological justifications for everything that had happened in, in trying to make them parody themselves, roughly speaking, it was a rough game and Solzhenitsyn also concluded that there was no helping someone like that when they were still ensconced inside that braying ideology you could predict everything they were going to say it's like someone had a crank you could just crank it and out would come the proper ideological formulas but then he realized that as soon as they let's call it repented of that and started to realize their, their own role in it or the error of the system then he would start communicating with them, you know, as if they were people who who you could communicate with, yeah so that was very interesting as far as I'm concerned, anyways this kid is still a little bit human, he starts to cry for his mom and the coachman basically throws him back into the crate and says that he's not ready yet and the reason for that is that he could still, he still had the power of independent speech you remember, right at the beginning of the movie, when the mouth was painted on Pinocchio we saw that mask that was really glaring at the process and I said that character recurs continually throughout the movie and this is a good example of that because the coachman is the enemy of anything that has its own voice so he's the anti-Geppetto, that's a good way of thinking about it he's the tyrannical aspect of the, of the culture but as insofar as one of these mostly donkeys, mostly jackasses can still talk then they're not completely fit for slavery and you remember this movie was also being made at about the same time that um, the Nazi transformation of Germany was taking place and so all these terrible underground things, you know, this, this process whereby people were being reduced to, to ideological slaves, say and in this terrible process that was all playing out in Europe in a very big way and it's not like people weren't aware of that, you know, it was in the air so, 